Welcome to North Shore. If you're here in this room, if you're joining us online, if it's your first time, it's Christmas kickoff. It's an amazing Sunday. I can see lots of people who dressed in their festive attire hoping to win the contest. Uh, we'll get to that in a little bit. And I want to say hi and welcome all of you. I came in solidarity with those of you who didn't dress up uh, because God loves you too. And your scroogey little souls that happen. I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm teasing. Um, it's just like me as well. Um, but festive attire aside, I'm super glad you're here because we're kicking off this new series for Christmas called Hear Them Sing. Hear who sing? Well, pretty much everybody in the first Christmas story. If you know the story, you can read in the first two chapters of the Gospel of Luke. Pretty much everyone breaks out in a song. Mary, the mother of Jesus, sings a song. Zachariah, the father of John the Baptist, sings a song. This man named Simeon in the temple who meets the baby Jesus sings a song. Of course, the story of the angels greeting shepherds, they break out into song. The first Christmas story wasn't just told, it was sung. And it's still being sung today, right? I mean, there are more songs about Christmas than any other event in human history. And we know most of them by heart, right? Like we just, we know them, we've heard them, we've sung them. So I thought we could play like a little game to start today, just a little finish that tune where I'm going to start a Christmas song and then you're going to jump in and just finish the line, okay? Is everybody, can we all do that? Got the singing voices ready to go? Don't leave me hanging up here, okay? So I'll just start and then as loud as you can, even if you can't sing on tune, just jump in. We'll just do a couple of these. So here we go. Joy to the world. That's good, but I know you could do better, okay? I know you could do better. Here we go. How about this one? Silent night. Oh. Yep. See, we just know these songs. How about this one? It came upon a midnight clear. I did that on purpose. I did that on purpose. Nobody knows that one. I don't know why. We got to get that one in the rotation. So I'm like, nobody knows that song. Anyway, with most Christmas music, we've heard it. We've sung it, and we know it. Why? Because music has a power that goes beyond words. Kind of interesting story, kind of amazing story, actually, that kind of illustrates this. About 10 years ago, uh, there was a young girl, seven-year-old girl named Charlotte, who suffered a brain hemorrhage, fell into a coma, and the doctors didn't know if she was going to wake up. Well, one day, her mom's sitting at her bedside, holding her hand, and an Adele song comes on the radio. And it's a song that her mom and her daughter, they would sing together all the time. And as soon as uh, she heard the song, her mom started singing it to her, singing it to Charlotte. And as soon as she started singing, her daughter started smiling. Somehow, the music was getting through in a way that words couldn't. And eventually, after singing the song over and over, Charlotte started to move. And a few days later, she actually woke up. Because nobody can sing like Adele, right? Like, this is like a moment for Adele. Like, nobody could do that. Music has this power, this impact on us that goes beyond words or information. In fact, we know from studies in neurology that music gets stored in a different part of your brain than words or facts or information. It's why you could still remember songs and melodies that you learned 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. It's why patients who suffer from memory loss or dementia can still remember music or sing music, even conduct music. It's why our two-year-old son, Jude, can recite the entire alphabet. Here's the thing. He doesn't know how to say it. He just knows how to sing it. A, B, C, D, E, right? He knows the song, which is why as long as there are babies, there will be lullabies, right? As long as, there, or as long as people fall in love, there will be love songs. As long as people break up, there will be country music. Like there's always going to be <laughs> music has this power, right? It's why faith in God has always, always, always involved music and singing. And you can go back through scripture and you can find it over and over. When the Israelites crossed over the Red Sea, delivered out of Egypt, they sang a song. When they would march around cities and they were in battle with Canaanites, they would sing songs. After David de defeated Goliath, the Israelites broke out into song. When Solomon fell in love, he didn't just sing a song. He wrote the song of songs, right? At least according to him right? So in the news that the long awaited Messiah was finally coming, they didn't just tell each other, they sang. So for these next few weeks, we're going to unpack and dive into these amazing 
little uh, just capsules of incredible theology and story and song as we prepare our hearts for Christmas. We're literally going to do our best. We don't know how they were sung, but to hear them sing. Starting with the very first Christmas song that was ever sung. This is the first song, the first Christmas song ever is the one we're going to walk through today. And it was sung by the very first person to hear the news, to be told that this story, this Jesus was coming. It was actually a first century teenage girl named Mary who was told by an angel named Gabriel that she was going to be the mother of the son of God himself. And we'll unpack her song, but just imagine as we read through it, this is her song. Just imagine her singing these words after she hears the news. She sings, my soul glorifies the Lord. Some versions say, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. And so, God, we pray that you would open the words, the music of this song to us today, that somehow through your words to us, this song could become our song. That these words would become our words, that we would understand them all the way down to the depths of our soul, but more so that we would sing them all the way out with the extent of our lives. We pray this in your name. And everybody said, amen. My soul magnifies the Lord. That's really the title of the song, if you think about it. In fact, uh, traditionally speaking, the song is known as the Magnificat, which is the Latin word for to glorify or magnify something. And then Mary follows that line with this another amazing line. She says, and my spirit rejoices in God. And that word rejoice in the original language isn't just rejoicing. It's like super rejoicing. In fact, it's a word that doesn't appear in any other Greek literature of the day, only in the Bible. It's like the biblical writers had to make up a word that described like rejoicing on steroids, like really rejoicing, really singing. Mary's song, though when you go through the text, you might read it and almost find yourself tuning out or getting distracted. It wasn't like a quiet, peaceful meditation. It was an outburst of praise. My soul magnifies the Lord. And my God is bigger and stronger and better than anything else. And from now on, she says, everyone's going to call me blessed. Which might sound like a normal way to respond now that we know the rest of the story. But if you know first century life, everyday life, you know that's not what people would have thought about Mary. In many ways, just the opposite. And Mary, Mary would have known it. Mary knew she was really, really young, only 13 or 14 years old at the time. Mary knew that she was, she had grown up in a, you know, an impoverished family. She had no money or resources to navigate this situation. And she knew the consequences of becoming pregnant before she was married. And they were real in that day, friends. She knew she'd have to tell the story to her family and they would probably not believe her. She knew she'd have to tell the story to her soon-to-be husband, Joseph, who might leave her for it. And she knew that the word would eventually get out around town and she would be labeled an adulteress. You know, it's a small town, Nazareth, and Nazareth, and people talk in small towns and they don't forget. And she knew that even if adultery couldn't be proven, which it couldn't be proven, She knew she would face what they called in that day, what was called the law of bitter waters. And here's how that worked. It means that when they, someone was accused of adultery, but they couldn't prove it, they would do this. They would take them out to a public place. They would expose them publicly. And the woman would be forced to drink a mixture of dirt, ink, and water. This bitter mixture. And if the water made the woman sick, it was believed to be like a sign that she was guilty. 
She would face the law of bitter waters. Which why, by the way, if you know the story, when she hears the news from the angel, Luke tells us that she hurried out into the hill country in Judea to visit her cousin Elizabeth. She wasn't just excited. She was probably scared and in danger. And yet instead of singing, why me or please God pick somebody else, she sings, my soul magnifies the Lord. It's a song of total surprise. A total surprise. And by the way, so is the Christmas story itself. So is the sheer fact that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That's not normal. (laughs) You've heard the story, so maybe it sounds normal, but it's like the world's most outlandish surprise ever. No one was expecting the Messiah to come. They thought he would come, you know, to conquer the world, but not to die on a cross for it. But if I'm honest with you today... It's this story, it's this surprise, it's the reason why I follow Jesus. I'm not in this just for the business of doing church. I apologize if that's what you think that we're about. It's just business of running a church organization. It's because God stepped into the mess, the darkness, the confusion, the surprising difficulties of my own life and said, that's where I'm going to meet you. And it's the most surprising story that's ever been told. And Mary's song is the most surprising response that's ever been sung. My soul magnifies the Lord, even though she's a 14-year-old girl staring down a life of gossip, hardship, and pain. What a surprise. Her song is surprising. It's also quite bold, even dangerous to sing a song like this. I mean, think back to what she's actually singing in this song. A few phrases. She talks about God has scattered the proud. He has brought down rulers. He has sent the rich away Empty, empty. It's not just a song about Christmas. It's a song about justice. It's a song that had King Herod, who was the king of the province in that day, rich, powerful, conniving. The same guy who, when he thought he was threatened by this king of the Jews baby, had all the baby boys in that area killed. It's it's this kind of song that would have had, he would have had Mary arrested the second he heard it. Because rulers and politicians, politicians have never much liked Mary's song. And this is true historically. I'm not making that up. During the Protestant Reformation, here's an example. Martin Luther didn't translate the Mary's song from Latin to German like he did the rest of the Bible because the rulers of his day didn't want the commoners to get any bad ideas from it. In the 1980s, it was actually illegal to read or to sing Mary's song in places like Guatemala and El Salvador because it was too politically subversive. So here's the thing. If your mental picture of Mary is a nice, passive girl who quietly sits on the sidelines, you've got the wrong picture. She is bold. She is brave. She is resolved. She has a voice, and she's using it to call out those in power. God's justice is coming. It's a word of warning to those who are on top. And it's a word of hope to those who feel like they're on the bottom. Mary sings that God has been mindful of what she calls the humble state of his servant. It's a phrase. It's not just like a spiritual phrase. It reflects her actual lack of status, power, and resources. In other words, Mary is the kind of woman who would have no other place to put a baby Jesus than a manger. And that's why God chooses her. That's why. Because God cares about and God chooses, God selects, God, he blesses and places his favor upon those who've been forgotten or marginalized or silenced or abused. Some of you may know this, but Mary isn't the first unmarried pregnant woman in the Bible to be visited by an angel. This has happened before. The first, you got to go all the way back to the first pages of the Bible in the book of Genesis when uh, this woman named Hagar who was an Egyptian slave who was forced to sleep with Abraham so that he could have a child, only then be driven out into the wilderness to die. It was in that situation that she was visited by an angel who told her, Hagar, God is aware of what's happened to you. And her response is to call God El Roy. It's the first time anyone names God in the Bible. A single pregnant woman who's sent to the wilderness to die. She's the first person to assign God an actual name. She says, El Roy, which means God sees me. And that's Mary's song. God sees me. 
God sees you. Maybe right now, I know it's Christmas season. We're all festively dressed. There's a lot of planning, travel, meals, celebrating to do, family to see. But maybe, maybe also this season raises up stories that are filled with pain or heartache or betrayal or loss. And maybe you're sitting there right now. Maybe you're watching right now and nobody knows but you. Or maybe it feels like nobody cares but you. So here's the truth that we learn from Mary's song. God knows. God cares. God sees. And he doesn't favor the strong. He favors the weak. He doesn't favor the powerful. He favors the humble. It's all upside down to how our world works, isn't it? But then again, so is Christmas. This is the good news. So is Christmas. It's the story of a king born, not in a palace, but a manger. Of a savior who announced his rule, not from a throne, but on a cross. And when he died, no one would have believed that uh, the church, his following, would become the fastest growing movement in human history. No one would have believed that. No one would have believed that the the book about his life, the Bible, would become the best-selling book of all time. No one would have believed that over 2,000 years later, over 2 billion people would claim to follow him. By the way, anyone remember what year it is this year? This is not meant to be a trick question. Anyone know what year it is this year? 2022, right? 2,022 years after what? The birth of this man, Jesus. Everybody knows when Jesus was born. Nobody remembers when Augustus or Nero was born. Today, we name our children names like Mary, Joseph, or John. We name our dogs Nero, right? (laughs) The good news of Christmas is that Jesus, the baby in the manger, is king, not Caesar. The good news is that the last are going to be first, and the first will be last. The good news is that God humbles the proud, and he lifts up the humble. And isn't it amazing that this teenage girl from an ordinary family in an unsung village was brave enough to sing it long before anybody else? My soul magnifies the Lord. Her song is bold. Her song is surprising. But most importantly for us today, as we learn to sing her song together, her song is a song of surrender. My soul magnifies the Lord. To magnify something is to increase and expand its role and place in your life. It gets bigger and you get smaller. And here's the thing, friends. Everybody magnifies something. Everybody magnifies something. It could be success. It could be beauty. It could be sex. It could be security. It could be intelligence. It could be reputation. It could be appearance. Everybody magnifies something. And when you magnify something, you literally entrust your life to it. For example, when you magnify your work, you're entrusting your life to your work or success or your resume or achievement. When you magnify what other people think about you, when it gets bigger in your life, you are entrusting yourself to your reputation, to your image. Everybody magnifies something. Everybody entrusts their lives to something. Mary magnified God. Mary entrusted her life to God. In fact, when the angel appeared and told her the news, she didn't magnify her circumstances or her fear or her shame or all the things that go wrong. Look at what she says. These are remarkable words. She said, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to to me be fulfilled. In other words, your will, not mine. God, your plan, not mine. God, your agenda, not mine. Mary said, yes. Yes, I'm entrusting my life to you. Why? Because she believed that God would be faithful. And that's where the blessing comes. In fact, when she's visiting her cousin Elizabeth, when she's there, Elizabeth has this profound statement. She looks at her and she says, blessed is she who believes the Lord would fulfill his promise to her. It's very personal. Blessed is she who believes the Lord would fulfill his promise to her and to you. Blessed are you when you believe that God will fulfill his promise to you. To you. 
And if you look back at her song, she doesn't sing about what God might do or what she hopes he'll do. She sings about what he's already done. He's already scattered the proud. He's already brought down rulers. He's already filled the hungry. In other words, she's not waiting to see if God's going to come through. She already has the proof that he has, and it's the baby growing in her stomach. Friends, Jesus is the proof that God is faithful regardless of circumstances, regardless of difficulty, regardless of what anybody else says or believes or thinks. Jesus is the proof that he's faithful. I love how the Apostle Paul once put it when he was reflecting on this promises of God in Christ. He said, no matter how many promises God has made, guess what? They are yes in Christ. How many of them? All of them. Everyone, no matter how many, no matter what they are, they are all yes in Christ. So if you're wondering, am I going to be able to find fear, freedom from fear in my life, fear or worry? The answer in Christ, the answer is yes. If you're living with shame or regret and you're wondering, will I ever get a second chance in my life? In Christ, the answer is yes. If you're facing a circumstance that feels impossible and you're wondering, how will I ever get through this in Christ? The answer is yes, he can take you through it. Because all God's promises are yes in Christ. And friends, that's actually what this song is all about. At its core, it's not about Mary saying yes to God. It's about God saying yes to Mary. Mary, you have found favor with God. You have been chosen. So it doesn't matter if the whole world stands against you because I am with you. I am for you, he says. And friends, that is why Mary sings. That's why she breaks into song and her joy. It is not rooted or based in her circumstances. By the way, by the way, her circumstances never really get any better. She gives birth in a barn. She has to flee the country as a refugee. She loses her husband. She watches her own son get rejected, arrested and executed on a cross. A man named Simeon, whose song we're going to look at in a couple of weeks, tells her, Mary, a sword is going to pierce your soul, which means she's going to suffer for Jesus long before anyone else suffers for Jesus. And yet her song is not a song of grief or lament. It's one of praise and joy on steroids. My soul magnifies God because real joy does not originate in our circumstances. It comes from saying yes to God. Yes I'll follow wherever that leads. Yes, I'll trust you through whatever comes. Yes, I'll be faithful no matter what the cost. That is the heart of the very first Christmas song. And friends, that's what the church of Jesus has been singing for 2,000 years. Christmas is not just about opening presents or trees or meals or that stuff. It's about saying yes to the God who is and always will be faithful. And guess what else is true about this song? This is a song that Jesus grew up hearing over and over and over. In fact, it's quite possible these were the first words that Jesus ever learned, ever knew. Why? Because what do moms do when they're rocking their little ones to sleep? They sing their song. Our son Jude is two and a half and he loves to sing before bed. I mean, he loves to sing so much so that I have to plan ahead like what songs we're going to sing and how many songs we're going to do. Because if not, I'll be there all night. Because whenever we get to what I think is the last one, he always says, one more song, daddy, one more song, daddy. In fact, if I sing and close the door and say goodnight, he screams the door, one more song, daddy. He's like throwing stuff out of his crib. Like it's got to be one more song. Well, I can imagine Jesus as a little boy Saying one more song, mommy, one more song. And I imagine he heard this song song throughout his life. As Mary nursed him. As she nurtured him. As she taught him. As she played hide and seek with him. Remember, she was the one who raised him after his father Joseph died. She walked with him as a teenager. God help her through that one, right? Right. She watched him turn water into wine. She believed in him even when his hometown didn't. She was the only person who was at his side, both at his birth and at his death. In fact, she was there in Acts 1 when the remaining disciples gathered and the spirit descended and the church exploded. She was there all the way through his life, always humming the same tune. 
In fact, if you look closely at Jesus' life, he's just living out his mother's song, isn't he? You can hear it when he teaches disciples, he teaches his disciples to pray, God, holy is your name. That's Mary's song. You can hear it when he says, blessed are the meek, the humble, for they will inherit the earth and be lifted up. Well, that's Mary's song. You can hear it when he feeds 5,000, filling the hungry with good things. Well, that's Mary's song. And you can hear it when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, asking God if there's some other way, but then just like his mom, he says, not your will, but my, not my will, but yours be done. May your word, God, be fulfilled in me. That's just Jesus saying, see, mom, I'm just singing our song. I said yes, too. Mary's song is really just Jesus's song. It's a pastor named Gail Jones who once told the story. I love the story. It's about a village in Africa where mothers would write songs for and over their children. And that mother would sing that song as the baby was growing in her room. She would teach it to the family so they could all sing it together when that baby was born. And by the time the baby was born, the village would actually know the whole song. And that way, when that child had a problem or fell or got scared, they could come comfort that child with the child's song. It would be the song that was sung at that child's birthday, at their uh, wedding, at moments of joy or moments of loss. That song would follow them all the days of their life until the day they died. And it would be sung one last time and then would never be sung again. The song died with them. And in a way, that's true about every other life and every other song. But this one, Mary's song. It was sung throughout Jesus' life from the day he was born to the day that he died. But here's the thing about Jesus. He didn't stay dead. On the third day, he rose, which means he's alive. And that means Jesus is still singing this song. He's still scattering the proud and bringing down rulers and filling the hungry and lifting up the humble. He's still singing her song. So here's my question for you. What song are you singing? What song is your life singing? Because everybody magnifies something. Everybody entrusts their life to somebody. Every life has a song. And when we say yes to Jesus, when we magnify him, this amazing thing happens in our lives. When he gets bigger, that fear gets smaller. When he becomes our song, that problem gets smaller. When we learn his song, that pain gets smaller. And I know this is true because of the faith of a 14-year-old girl with the weight of the world on her shoulders who didn't complain or despair or lose hope and said, she broke out into song. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in my God, my Savior. Friends, this is the song of those who say yes. It's the song of those who surrender. And Jesus is inviting each of us today and this Christmas to make her song and his song our song in our lives. And so I want to give you a chance to do that right now. So if you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. My soul magnifies the Lord. Friends, the short version of this song is this one simple word. It's the word yes. Yes, Jesus, I will trust you. Yes, Jesus, I will magnify you. Yes, you can get bigger. I can get smaller. Your will, not mine. Your plan, not mine. Your agenda, not mine. Friends, this is the, this is the song of faith. It's the only song we need to learn. And if you never sang this song, if this isn't what your life sings today, I want to invite you to make a decision right now to say, Jesus, I want this to be my song too. That you can say yes to him right now. That you can receive his favor and blessing on your life regardless of your circumstances right now just by saying, yes, my soul magnifies you, not me. And I'll follow you wherever you go. And if that's your prayer today, If you want to say yes to him for the first time or maybe for the first time in a long time, I want you to do me a little favor. All the heads are down, eyes are closed. Just raise your hand and say, I'm saying yes to Jesus today. 
Thank you. Hold up that hand. Just hold up that hand. This matters that you say it. Make it your song. Yes, thank you, Jesus. And before you leave, here's my request. Here's my challenge. Make sure you come to the station on my right, on your left, that says, I said yes. Make sure you come by. Let us know. Let us pray with you. It's a song we sing together, this one. It's a song the church has sang for 2,000 years. It's our great yes to Jesus. Our souls magnify God. And the best place, the best place, the best way to sing that song is to be on your knees. Humbly. He has been mindful of the humble state of a servant. You don't sing that confidently. You don't sing that with your arms crossed. You sing that on your knees, hands up high. My soul gets to magnify this amazing God today. And friends, when you do that, when you say yes, it changes everything. And so Jesus, we say yes, and we sing, our soul magnifies you. Hear us sing.